Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Connect. It's, uh, it's man, it's a big room. Uh, it's so amazing to see all of our customers, our partners, and everybody here. We, we had a great, great session last night, and just the number of people that we're talking to that are here trying to figure out how they're going to help transform their business. And, um, and that's what this conference is about. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to help with. And, and the title of, of this presentation um, is around how you will harness hyper-specialization. I can't say that three times fast. But harnessing hyper-specialization is really the challenge that everybody's facing. When you get up in the morning, if one or two clicks away, you will learn about a new service, a new API, a new SaaS application, a new technology that's being made available to you. Every single day, there's just this torrent of capabilities that are being made available to you as an organization, as a team, as an individual. And the challenge you have is how do we harness that? How do we make that available to our organization? How do we, how do we leverage that faster than our competition is, is leveraging it? How do we win by taking advantage of this m massive groundswell of technologies that we're facing? That is the big challenge that we all face. And I think the best way to think about this is to step back a little bit and think about how it's changed over time. So I want to look back over the last 100 years and look at how the evolution of really of organizations and business as they've gone over time. So I'm going to go way back. This is the Model T. The Model T Ford was revolutionary in its time, not just as a, as a car, but also by how it was built. It was, it was about creating a modern day assembly line. And Henry Ford really pioneered the modern day assembly line. And that was the Model T. But the challenge they had was, how are you going to be a car company? How do you bring all of the things that you need to bring together, the glass, the steel, the rubber, everything that you need to make a Model T Ford? Really difficult in 1910 to make that happen. How many people here have heard of Fordlandia? Wow. One. And I didn't mean Portlandia, Fordlandia. Okay, we got one, a couple. Okay, so a few people have heard of Fordlandia. So Ford had such a challenge getting rubber for the tires and hoses in their car that they went to Brazil, contracted with the Brazilian government to build Fordlandia, 2.5 million acres for, uh, to build out a rubber tree plantation in the Amazon. Imagine that, the folks from Detroit, can you imagine the people from Detroit showing up in the Amazon, we're here to grow some rubber trees, right? They wanted to plant rubber trees on one end and have Model T Fords rolling off the assembly line on the other end. And eight years later, after many, many cases of yellow fever and malaria, Ford decided that that probably wasn't such a great idea to be in the jungles trying to grow rubber. But that was what they, had to fa that what they faced. And the reason was is that they were having to basically build a company that was about coordinating raw materials and labor. They were, it was monolithic from 1900 to around 1980. Business, kind of business 1.0, was really about big monoliths. It was about controlling raw materials and labor. And the reason that they had to do it, not necessarily because they really wanted to, I'm sure Ford did not want to be in the jungle planting rubber trees. But the reason they had to do it was because it was just difficult at that time to manage it any other way. So communications were limited. Markets were limited. They were fairly local. They were fairly opaque. Logistics were, were decent. You had rail and you had shipping, and, um, but we didn't have anything nearly like we do today. And then finally, the consumption model, how you were able to work together as co companies and corporations, pretty much in-person, handshakes, uh, not something that you could coordinate a vast global supply chain in that day. So that was why we had to build out these big, these big, huge monolithic organizations. Okay, so fast forward to today, and here's the newer Ford. So this is a Ford Mustang, and while it's still a Ford, it is built in a completely different way than the Ford Model T was built. This Mustang is built with a vast 
array of suppliers, a whole supply chain that is behind this Ford Mustang to make it, to bring it together. And it's just amazing when you look at the components that go into a car like this and where they come from. So in this one, the, gas, the, 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 the gasoline tank comes from another supplier. The dashboard and the console comes from another supplier. The turbocharger inside the engine comes not from Ford, but from a supplier that specializes in building turbochargers and builds them for automobiles and builds them for ships and builds them for uh, 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 construction industry. They can leverage all of that knowledge and know-how now inside of Ford instead of Ford having to be an expert and to specialize in turbochargers. And the part that to me that was most interesting about this, this Mustang is uh, in one of, these, uh, one of these things, it talks about how the actual engine block on the Ford Mustang is built by another supplier. So if you think about automobile companies, the engine block, that is the core of what they've always done. That is really the, the, used to be the core competence of an automobile manufacturer, and now they just rely on a supplier to make that happen. So they're bringing together all of these different capabilities, harnessing these capabilities to build a car. And why are they able to do that? Why, why, why have we built these supply chains this way? Well, because communications got much better. We were able to communicate with these supply chains much easier. Markets became really very much more global where you could build anywhere and you could pull parts from anywhere because the logistics became easy. We went to containerization, not the containerization that we talk about in this room, but actual physical containerization in the 1960s. Containers were introduced for shipping and for land and sea. And that really changed the ability from a logistics standpoint to move materials around. And then finally, from a consumption standpoint, you could actually start to interact with companies remotely and to do it at an arm's length and to have those transactions happen globally in a fairly easy fashion. So we move from a core competence of a business being coordinating raw materials and labor to beginning to coordinate entire ecosystems. And that's, what, that's a massive shift that happened. But it wasn't just an automotive. It happened in high-tech electronics. It happened in consumer electronics. It happened in apparel. It happened across a wide range of industries. And it did, and it happened because we could, because the capabilities were there to now allow that. And now you could actually leverage and amortize the cost of development of all these different specializations and assemble it and create a, ver a horizontally integrated supply chain instead of what was vertical integration before. Fundamental shift, completely transformed many industries. Many companies were left by the wayside. The companies that adapted dominated. So that was kind of leading up to where we are today. And where we are today now is in this world of hyper-specialization, where every single component of what you do is starting to be made available in a set of products and a set of services that you can leverage. And one interesting area that I think is just amazing to look at is what's happened in, in, believe it or not, in marketing. So marketing as a function over time has really never been an area where a lot of technology was deployed. And that's changed dramatically. So one part of marketing, a fairly niche, important, but, it, but, but niche part of marketing is SEO, search engine optimization. And the technologies that you need to help optimize how you show up, what your page rank is as a marketing organization have exploded. And so the search engine optimization technology landscape looks like this. Almost 100 companies providing pieces of technology to help you run better SEO inside of your marketing organization. It's unbelievable. And so you think, wow, that's a lot for marketing, but what about other parts of the other functions? That's not all for marketing. That's just SEO. Let's zoom out and look at all of marketing. That's all of marketing. 3,500 technologies are now available for marketing practitioners to do better marketing. 3,500. And the gentleman that puts this together, he's been doing this since 2011. When he put his first logo chart together, there were 150 companies supplying technologies for marketing. Six years later, 3,500. So when we talk about hyper-specialization, that's what we're talking about. That's what you have available to you. 
And you might say, okay, but that's just marketing. Maybe that's unique. Maybe that's different. Let's take a look at another area. Take a look at what's happening with blockchain. These are the companies now that are providing solutions, technologies for blockchain and financial services. Massive number of companies already doing that with a fairly nascent technology. Let's look at an entire industry. So what about an industry? How many, how many companies are supplying technologies to higher education? Look at that list. Look at those logos. Unbelievable. If you went back 20 years ago, you might have found a handful of companies providing technologies to the higher education space. So that is the massive tectonic shift that we're facing, the groundswell of capabilities that we can leverage and harness and that are available to us. So if we look at 2017 and beyond, you've got your organization, you've got your company, and it's broken into different functions, different parts of the organization, and every one of those has the ability now to leverage all of these components. And why are we at this stage? So we move from kind of phase one, business 1.0, to business 2.0, to this business 3.0. How did we get here? Why are we at this place where we can hyper-specialize in this way? It's because communication now is just frictionless. Markets are completely global. Logistics, unbelievable. You can order something on eBay from China and it's delivered two days later to your doorstep. And then finally, the consumption model. You can build a company now in your bedroom just by clicking. I saw this great article of a guy who built a hoverboard company in two days over a weekend. He basically contracted with a supplier in China and built out hoverboards, developed his logo, put up his e-commerce site, and started selling hoverboards in two days. It was unbelievable. You can do all of this just a click away, and so can your competitors. Right? So we have this incredible opportunity to leverage these things. And what we have to do as organizations, and what I would challenge you with, is to help step back and think about how these changes are really going to impact your business over the long term. We've had these massive shifts. Phase one, big, monolithic, vertically integrated companies. Phase two, horizontally integrated companies controlling ecosystems and supply chains. And now, here we are today in these companies that have the ability to leverage hyper-specialization. And the question I would ask to everybody in this room is, are you ready? Are you ready to be able to leverage that? Because if you think about this, it is unfortunately, I wish it were just this easy that everything just stacked up nicely together in nice little building blocks, they all fit together, and you're all here this week because you know it's not that way, because you know there are massive challenges, and you know it looks a lot more like this. This is what you're faced with, capabilities on-prem, capabilities in the cloud, applications, data, devices, strewn everywhere. How do we make it all work together? So I've got one question for you guys. If you think about this, how many would you say that your organization, one, understands the massive shift that's taking place, and two, has a clear plan and vision for how you're going to harness that? Can I get a show of hands of how many people feel like their organizations have that nailed? Anybody? Okay. So that's why I wish we'd at least had a few. Um, that's why we're here. That's why we're here is that challenge and that vision needs to be there. And what I would encourage you to do is think about how you can lead your companies, lead your organizations to understand, number one, that this shift is taking place, and number two, you have to change your IT operating model to make it work. So next up, Ross Mason, our founder, is going to come up on stage, and Ross is going to talk about taking it to the next level down, thinking about moving from this challenge of harnessing hyper-specialization and moving it to the next level of how does one begin to build out an application network so that you can now harness these capabilities and leverage them. So thank you so much. Welcome to Connect. Great to have you. Hope you have a great week here. Thank you. <laughs>